My favorite. It's Judd's Hockey Show. Not sure what we're going to be able to do, when we're going to be able to do it. Um, nothing's, you know, open right now. We're still we're still shut down. I, I spoke to the league uh, a couple days ago, and, and there was a um, plan moving forward. But since then, we've had more cases, um, more positive cases. So, uh, you know, we have a call with the league today at 430 to, uh, you know, uh, with the league medical staff. Um, so we'll reassess where we are. And with that, welcome into Judd's Hockey Show that, of course, Wild GM Bill Guerin uh, talking about the team and basically the league's fight with COVID-19. Zolgad, Declan Goff, as always, and joining us, our buddy from the rink live, does a great job covering hockey and the Gophers in particular, and we'll certainly talk about them. Jess Myers, Jess, welcome to the show. What's up? Hey, guys, how you doing? It's uh, it's the heart of hockey season, so hey, it's all good. And it's and it's well below zero, it's seemingly everywhere, so it really does feel like hockey this season. Is very true. Very true. That, this is hockey that, season. That, that that mild winter was fun for a little while, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> we, had, we are always going to get this, okay? Like, we choose to live Absolutely. here. Absolutely. I'm fine with it. I'm fine with it. I could have moved. You too. Declan too. All right. <clears throat> I'm going to start off by... by um, asking you guys a question or presenting a case and then asking you guys a question because right now, obviously since we did um, Judd's hockey show last week, the wild has been on pause and they now have 12 players sidelined by COVID 12 players on the list. We now have officially, I believe at least five teams that have been paused all of course in this country, not in Canada where things are going absolutely fine. The wild, the abs, the devils, the sabers, the flyers, and we actually had the the um, post game press conferences, the Zoom calls with the Vegas Golden Knights and the Ducks last night were essentially called off because a Vegas player had been pulled from the lineup in the second. Anyway, here's here's my point, and I want you, you guys to jump in off of this. As good a job as the league did in the bubble, which I praise them up and down. They got through it. They did a great job. No positive tests. Where is Gary Bettman right now? Like, you can't have... No, I'm dead serious, Jess. You can't have five teams paused. You can't be calling off press conferences. And and look, I, I accept what's going on. I get that part. But where is your commissioner? You are literally having the Coyotes and Blues play 87 games consecutively against each other because everybody else can't play them. Just start with you and then go to Dex. Where's Gary Bettman? There's a saying in I've heard it. I've heard football people say this more often, but there's a saying and it goes like this. Don't confuse hope for having a plan. Don't say, you know, we hope things are going to go well. Have a plan for how things are going to go well. The NHL started this season really hoping that things would go well as far as COVID. They didn't have a plan in place, or at least not a plan that works. You know, rapid testing, all those things. Look at the Big Ten, for goodness sake. We we did have a series postponed this coming weekend uh, in the Big Ten, but Big Ten hockey, for all the complaints about it, has done an amazing job of keeping guys healthy and keeping games being played. Um, so look around. I mean, this isn't that tough, Gary. Look around and and see what other leagues are doing with testing six times a week, with rapid results, all the stuff that, that other places are doing successfully, and do that. So where is Gary? I don't know, but, you know, we met Gary in 93 when he threw up his hands and said, eh, nothing I can do about your team going to Dallas. So, you know, this, this is nothing new. Yeah, it's kind of funny, too, because I thought in general in, in the early parts of summer when they're developing the plan that Gary honestly had a credit going pretty well for him, which we, we were joking like, oh my God, Gary Bettman looks competent of all the four major commissioners right now. All of a sudden, Gary Bettman's on top of the power rankings. But to Jess's point and to your point too, Judd, there was no real contingency backup plan. And now the cases are piling up. You have 25% of the league basically paused. I think, I mean, we're if, if Vegas indeed gets paused and uh, Arizona gets paused, you're, you're going to be talking about eventually having to pause the season for the lack of a better word. Because uh, I don't think they're going to be able to get through this at this time. Like the timeline that they're on right now, there's no way they're going to be able to finish this on time. So here's my plan now. In, in fact, since since Gary won't come forward with a plan, I will, okay? How about this one? We pause for 14 days. We pause for 14 days, and during that time, we evaluate what we've been doing, what we've been doing right, what we've been doing wrong, um, get everybody as healthy as possible. And during those 14 days, 
We redo the schedule. You ain't getting 56 games in for every team. It's ridiculous now. You're not going to do it. So get the schedule down to 45 games. Take the Canadian teams and offer up a $2 million prize for a tournament that they then play during the course of these 14 days that goes to the winner. I'm serious. Like, you've got to pause this thing. This makes no sense now. This makes no sense. So let's let's redo it, get schedules down. And if we don't, guys and Jess, if we don't get the schedules down, I think we have to accept that, that we're going to have to go to the same system that they went to for the bubble uh, qualifying round teams, points percentage. You can't make teams get – you're going to get guys hurt. And it's a, it's a look. We're trying to play, but we're trying to play through a pandemic. So so being steadfast about 56 games to me is ridiculous. So if you're not going to accept that, then accept the fact that a team like the the uh, Wild, let's say, plays 48 games, okay? And it's point percentage. Something like that. But I'm serious. I think they should pause this thing in the States, play a Canadian tournament, reward those teams, and get this thing right. Because right now, it's just embarrassing to have this many teams continually every day being like, we can't play for a week. Sorry. Peace out. Let the Blues and Coyotes play some more. And in other leagues that have had multiple games postponed, canceled, whatever, we're seeing that as now the standard, the points percentage. I'm thinking of the women's WCHA, where the Gophers schedule has been, you know, hey, we've got an hour of ice time. Anybody free to, to come give us a game? I mean, that's that's what it's become. And, you know, they've resigned to the fact that, hey, we're not going to get in a full schedule for every team. We've got to go with points percentage. Um it's just crazy. Some of the stuff, you know, I'm looking at it from a college hockey standpoint. We had a series a couple weeks ago. Michigan Tech was supposed to play Lake Superior State up in the UP. You know, two good WCHA programs. Uh, supposed to start the game at 7 Eastern. We get an email at like noon saying, well, we're pushing the game back an hour because the test results aren't going to be available yet. It's like, seriously? You know, we're, we're going to wait another hour. Okay, so they wait the hour. Then the test results come back. Oh, no, we can't play now. And then we get an email like, you know, two hours later saying Michigan Tech's got a game with Northern Michigan tomorrow instead. Honest to goodness, this is like youth hockey coaches calling around saying, hey, uh, you know, we had uh, you know, St. Louis Park cancel on us. Uh, hey, Woodbury, can you come over and, and play? And, you know, we'll, we'll get you all hot dogs after the game. I'll buy you a beer. <laughs> well, you know, college, you can't really do that. But. Uh, it's, well, it depends on the age. But, yeah, but, I, but look, th this is – the one sport where the fact that this thing spreads continually does not surprise me. Again, we had yes. a mumps outbreak. Nobody gets the mumps, right? This league had, what now, five years back, four years back, a mumps outbreak. So I get that. But come back with a smaller schedule and a plan and proceed from there. And it's almost like now it's just a joke. Oh, hey, hey, the Ducks aren't going to play for five days. I just, and, you know, Bill Guerin, the wild GM guys, having to basically come out and say, well, we really can't come back too quick. Like, he has to be the parent. Like, what's the league planning? You know, yeah, if Nico Sturm has to be your first line center, that's just, you know, Guerin's exactly right. So I just think that they need to regroup and, and accept the fact that at least in the States, they got big problems. And I know that they, you know, had good intentions to play 56 games, blah, blah, blah. But I don't see a clear path. And it's certainly not worth uh, potentially trying to play back to back to back to back games and guys being hurt just to, to right. say, yeah, but look, the Wild played 56 games. Yeah, I, I don't think you're going to see that. I don't think the Players Association would stand for that. You know, we heard that pre pre bubble last summer, uh, Devin Dubnik, when he was still with the Wild, said, I don't know how many players are going to buy into the idea of, hey, you're going to go be away from your family for two months. Now, eventually they did, and it worked out pretty well. And it, let's face it, for the Wild, it was being away from your family for about a week because they were they were knocked out pretty quickly. But, uh, you know, there are things like that at work. The Players Association is still pretty powerful. And, you know, I really don't think you're going to see guys signing up to, you know, play – three games have a day off, play another three games have a day off, you know, things like that. I, I just don't think the quality of the product is going to be there if you try and shoehorn that many games in late in the season just to say you played a full schedule. All right, boys. Hot button issue of the week. 
Miko Koivu plays 15 years as a member of, of the Wild. Uh, he then is told after the, the qualifying round that just uh, referred to that he is not going to be brought back. I think there was an expectation among some that he might say, okay, peace out. I'm done playing. Thank you very much. But he does not. He, he says, I'm going to continue to play. I'm going to shop my services. He gets signed to a contract by uh, John Tortorella's Columbus Blue Jackets. Koivu plays seven games and then on Monday or Tuesday suddenly announces that he is done. And so this is going, Jess, this is going to now bring up the great debate. Uh, and there are certainly a lot of mixed emotions and feelings on this. Should the number nine be raised to the rafters at the X? I'm going to allow you to start uh, and then Dex. Would you, do you think it's a slam dunk that Koivu should, should be the first real player, not the fans, you're number one. <laughs> do you think that Miko should be the first real wild player to have his jersey retired and it's the number nine? No. Uh, I'm just going to put it out there. I don't, I don't see retiring Miko Koivu's number. Now, he was an important player for this franchise for a lot of years. Uh, he was never a star player. You know, I, I don't think anybody at any point in the in the history of this franchise bought a ticket saying, I want to go see Miko Koivu and see what he, you know, see what he's going to do versus the Avalanche. Um, I think he was an important part of this franchise, but I don't think that warrants Jersey retirement. And on this topic, by the way, I, I made this note on Twitter. I'll make it here. Someday when I finish my basement, I'm going to have a framed Miko Koivu Blue Jackets jersey. Next to that, I'm going to have a framed Mike Piazza Marlins jersey, five games. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to have a uh, Randy Moss Titans jersey, eight games. <laughs> and I think I'll probably have to get like a Franco Harris Seahawks jersey. Just, you know, just oh, kind of wow. line up there. You know, when you talk about players who were very briefly with one team. Oh, and, and then, of course, my favorite, Chris Chelios with the Atlanta Thrashers, because uh, that's where, where he ended his career. I, I, I think I've got to have that jersey collection somehow, right? That's a fantastic it collection. Is. Yeah, just guys who played a hot tick with the team and are like, see you later. Exactly. This ain't going to work out for Mike, me. Mike, Mike Madonna with the Red Wings, you know. There you go. I literally took the words He should have come mouth. back here. He should have. He should have played here. <laughs> Absolutely. We, we would have loved it. There, there would have been a call to retire – Madonna's jersey just because he had played so so are, are you close Jess on on this or no let me let me add this caveat I think yeah. the Wild probably will retire his number I think this is uh, a, a way for them to create kind of some history of this franchise which has still only been around 20 years I think this is a way you know how, how many how many weekends did the twins have honoring Kirby Puckett <laughs> over the course of, of their career you know, where you know, they had one one weekend where they retired his number. They had another, you know, it seemed like they had a, a Kirby Puckett night every season. And, you know, oh, it's a for, for teams to sell tickets and create some hype and create some media attention. So I think it's something that the Wild and their marketing arm probably will do. I just don't necessarily think it's warranted uh, to have a player's number retired. And you also wonder if you don't do something like a ring of honor, like the, like the Vikings have done, where you don't necessarily retire a guy's number. But yep. you have it, you have it up there, and and you know, guys can. I I I believe I could be wrong on this, but I believe number ten is the only number that the Vikings have actually retired. Uh, that was Fran Tarkenton, of course. Different semantics, different reasons. Um, yes, I think they'll end up doing it, but I think it's an absolute criminal. It's it's a, it's a shame to do it to a Minnesota sports fan. The fact that Miko Koivu is going to be retired before Kevin Garnett or Randy Moss, I think, is absolutely insane to me. And Miko represents the franchise. He was he was their what their second first round pick in team history. I get what he was yep. able to mean to this team, but he never won a major award. I think they only got yeah, they only got to the first round twice during his tenure. He was never a perennial all star. I hate to be like the old curmudgeon here, but like what has he done outside of spent his entire career here? But he was a good defensive forward and he was a good penalty killer. So is Joel Erickson Eck going to be retired in 15 years if he spends his whole career here? Like where? Where are we rewarding that? Like, it's not even close to the level of dynamics that Garnett and Moss, and I'll even throw this name in, Joe Maurer made on the Minnesota sports team. And Maurer's very controversial too, but it's not even, Miko isn't even the same breath 
as those guys when it comes to iconic Minnesota sports fans. I know hockey is a cult sport. I know they're diehards and they support their guys. And I, I think that's great. But I just do not understand the the rush also, the rush to want to retire his number. And Jess is right, though. This, to me, is a great um, um, jumping off point to establish a, a wild Hall of Fame ring of honor. I don't care what you call it. Because yep. Miko Koivu, 1,000% deserves a knight. And he deserves a bobblehead. And he deserves a stuffed doll. Um, all of that stuff is great. But when we're talking about, about the highest honor that you can give an athlete to me from a team in sports, right? And and it might not be fair, Jess and Dex, but it is also a number that is a religious experience in hockey, the number nine. Like yep. the guy that wears that, if that goes to the rafters, should be a guy who is going to walk into the Hall of Fame. I mean, or skating or take, take your pun. But I mean, this is literally a player that should step right into Toronto and the Hall of Fame. Koivu did not win a cup here. He didn't get close. I don't think he is going to be, at the end of the day, a Hall of Fame player. He did not win a scoring title. He did not win major awards. Um, I think we get confused here by by really quality longevity as greatness. And it's not. It's not the same thing. Doesn't mean that I don't think he was good. It doesn't mean that I don't think that he should be brought back here and given a night. Um, but I can't do it. I simply cannot. And I think that if the wild uh, powers that be sit down in the coming months and, and say, let's start to plan for fans to be back uh, in 21, 22. And let's start to plan our nights, okay? And somebody says, well, at what point in time are we going to have the Koivu jersey retirement um, festivities? I, I would say this. Examine what you're saying as far as the mediocrity that we've been subjected to from that team. And I love the sport for 20 years. Because that's what that is. Like, if that's your player, if, if this was a conversation about Gabrick had played 15 years here, right? And had scored a ton of goals and they had made a Stanley Cup finals. Then the number 10 goes up and that's cool. But we're talking about a conversation, just to your point, about how do, do we, you know, market this and it gives, and it's, it's uh, if you retire Koivu's jersey, it sort of signifies his time period here. But what was his time period here? A disappointment. You know, yeah. it was crazy. Yeah, it was underachieving. It was underachieving. Exactly right. So, so what? So what about that causes you to say we need to acknowledge it? Like with yeah. again the highest honor that you can give. I just don't see it. I, yeah, I see a ring of honor type thing. Absolutely, you know. And I see like a, a Marion Gabrick in that. I see Zach Parisi. I see Ryan Suter in in that ring of honor type type thing. But not not with a number of retirement. I, I I don't warrant that. Now. You know, we, we mentioned Randy Moss. I, I still, you know, it's still weird to me to see Cordero Patterson or Andre Allison or somebody like that wearing number 84 because you talk about an iconic player and yes, you know, didn't win a Super Bowl here, didn't win a Super Bowl anywhere in his career. But um, you think of a, a franchise changing person, you know, a, a, and we've talked before about a Randy Moss and and seems to be deserving of that honor. But but yeah, I, I just don't see it for a player like Miko Koivu. Um, now, uh, with that said, always, you know, had a, a, a positive experience with him as a team captain. He understood his role. He was always the, the one who would stand up and talk to the media, even after, you know, they put some real crap out on the ice a lot of nights. You know, he was the one who, who knew, hey, I'm going to be at my locker. I will speak on behalf of the team. I will do my job because I have the C on my sweater. I also think a huge accomplishment was the fact that he kept that C on his sweater the last 10 years during a time when Zach Parisi came on board and, you know, seemingly everyone thought this is Parisi's team. Why doesn't he, he, you know, have the letter on his sweater, all of that, you know, we've heard all the talk that Parisi and Suter have tried at various times to take over the locker room. I don't know, you know, the accuracy of that, but that was certainly the rumor mill surrounding the wild. And the fact that Miko Koivu was able to kind of hang on to that position says something to me about his leadership as well. 